Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick. I'm a broadcast journalist for the Associated Press and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, we'd invite you to please visit our website at www.press.org and to donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library. You can find that information on our website as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table guests include guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club available through iTunes. And you can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag pound NPC lunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests and I'd ask each of you here on the table to stand up briefly as your name is announced and we begin from your right. Dana Ritter, White House producer for CBN News and I'm told the second baseman on the NPC softball team. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's only the softball team in attendance today because Mike Deagle is public affairs communications consultant and first baseman so you have the, the double play combination in place there. We have Matt Friedman. He's one of my colleagues at Associated Press as an online video producer, and he's also a new member. So welcome, Matt. Mark Cannon is managing editor for Public Safety Communications. Spencer Joint, who's Harry's godson, freshman at Georgetown University, and a guest of the speaker. John Doman is an anchor reporter for Westwood One Metro Networks. David Korn, Washington Bureau Chief of Mother Jones and an analyst for MSNBC and also a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the podium for just a moment, Melissa Charbonneau, Newshook Media, Chair of the Speakers Committee. We'll skip over the speaker for a moment. Patty Giglio is a Communications Consultant and Speakers Committee member who organized today's event. Bill Schneider is former CNN political analyst, now teaching public policy at George Mason University, guest of the speaker, and also with Third Way, which is a Washington think tank. Tim Young is a freelance journalist and himself actually a working comedian. He's chair of the National Press Club's Young Members Committee, which he's leading very well. Rachel Ray is U.S. television reviewer for the Daily Telegraph of London. And Charlie Clark, another new member here at the Press Club, he's senior correspondent with Government Executive Magazine. And now, how about a round of applause? So those of you who are familiar with our lunch and speaker series here at the National Press Club probably know that the format calls for this to run about an hour in length. Well, this is particularly difficult and challenging today for the simple reason that getting through a proper introduction of our speaker, reviewing all of his accomplishments, accolades, and activities could probably take up the entire hour. But that would be not what you're here for. Our guest is an actor known for, among other things, the many character voices for The Simpsons, including Mr. Burns, Smithers, and Principal Skinner. He's been a regular cast member on Saturday Night Live, and his many movie credits include The Right Stuff, The Fisher King, The Truman Show, This is Spinal Tap, and The Mighty Wind, among others. He's an author, director, and satirist, a musician, a radio host, playwright, and a record label owner. He's a Los Angeles native who began his acting career during his childhood, making appearances on the Jack Benny program. It was then that he got to know the great Mel Blanc, who did a few voices in his day as well. He appeared in the pilot of Leave it to Beaver in the role that would eventually morph into that of Eddie Haskell. <laughs> True story. Got a lot of applause on that. Yeah. Very well remembered. For the past few years, though, he's been writing about the causes and aftermath of the 2005 New Orleans flood. On this subject and others, he's a regular contributor to Huffington Post. He also made a feature-length documentary titled The Big Uneasy. I was fortunate enough to meet him last fall during a screening of that movie here in town, and that's when we discussed having him here today. Before that, some of the stories titled Crescent City Stories told about the hurricane's aftermath via online video were very compelling. They're still there. You can see those on the website, My Damn Channel. 
Harry's focused a fair amount of attention on the news media's handling of the Katrina story. And as some of you may know, one of my priorities this year is to use our luncheon series to focus more on journalism. That's something we did just a week ago with Vivian Schiller, who at the time was head of National Public Radio. <laughs> as we know now, she's since resigned. While some of the subjects we're going to discuss today have serious themes, I know we're all looking forward to enjoying the unique sense of multifaceted sense of humor that's just one of the many gifts that our guest speaker has been blessed with. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to Harry Shearer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, Central Time. Um, I'm honored and delighted to have been invited to uh, appear here at the National Press Club today. In fact, just to get this out of the way right at the top, I'd venture to say that this whole occasion is excellent. <laughs> and I do want to pledge to you that, uh, unlike another recent guest at this podium, nothing I say today here will be contradicted by one of my executives in two days in a video sting. <laughs> Mainly because I have no executives. All right, so I've ripped off Rupert Murdoch and tossed a brush back pitch at Vivian Schiller. We can now get down to the business at hand. Uh, first, I want to say, as a New Orleanian, uh, my heart goes out to the people of Japan. People of New Orleans know a little bit about what you're going through right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as much as I was bewitched and besotted by comedy at an early age, I was also fascinated and seduced by journalism. I can remember at age five or whenever it was my parents first trusted me with blunt little scissors, cutting out and collecting the mastheads for all the different sections of the two daily papers we subscribed to, the main criterion for which was whichever papers in L.A. were still publishing and weren't the Times. When my moment came to be interviewed on TV by Art Linkletter, I confessed to my habit of making my parents take me to the out-of-town newsstand in Hollywood whenever possible, and for years our mailbox was filled with dailies from Fergus Falls, Minnesota, and other far-flung locales. A couple days late, but it didn't seem to matter. When I entered college at the tender age of 15, my first stop was at the office of the student newspaper, where I ended up as a senior editor. Thank you. <laughs> Our only source of income at the publication was if we had the, the job of putting the paper to bed at night, which involved working in a noisy old letterpress print shop where the entire staff except for the foreman was comprised of what we used to call deaf mutes. My chance at the editor-in-chief role was ruined by my refusal to disclose to the student council the identity of an anonymous grad student whose gentle satire and fraternity life I'd run on the op-ed page. I was suspected of being anti-Greek. <laughs> I watched CBS reports and David Brinkley reporting. I listened to BBC World Service and to NBC's riveting radio reporting on the Hungarian Revolution, riveted and moved by the slow dying out of the voices calling for help. I was and still am a news junkie. This is all by way of explaining that what I'm about to say comes not from hatred of journalism but from love of it. I've had zero nasty news stories written about me. There's still time, but <laughs> up to now. The only time I was in a tabloid involving sex, it was all benign and all true. <laughs> Details on request. In short, no way am I here to bang the poor, put-upon celebrity drum. I have spent much of my youth around journalism and journalists. I like their smarts and their dark sense of humor. And yeah, you're right. Now here come about 100 paragraphs of but. <laughs> In my youth, I worked for a while at the LA Bureau of Newsweek. Now, I know, I'm conflating journalism and Newsweek, but give me a break here. <laughs> Parenthetically, you may have noticed that Newsweek recently listed my adopted hometown of New Orleans as America's number one dying city. I'm proud to report that New Orleans has reciprocated honoring Newsweek as the nation's number one dying magazine. <laughs> But back to the story. One day while I was working at Newsweek, I got a call from the Life and Leisure editor in New York asking for examples from bureaus around the country of what he called rooftop living. Clearly, this fellow had returned to his 53rd floor office after a somewhat bibulous lunch, <laughs> stared out the window, 
noticed some potted plants on nearby rooftops, and sniffed out a trend. <laughs> Trends are what people like the life and leisure editor of Newsweek had to sniff out before they started being listed hourly on Twitter. So I dutifully called the dean of LA helicopter traffic reporters, Captain Max, who told me the obvious. Son, LA has plenty of land. Nobody needs to put anything on their roof. There were a couple of exceptions, including a guy, John B. Zerlo, who had installed a swimming pool and some Greek columns on the roof of his office building on the Sunset Strip. So I interviewed Mr. Zerlo, wrote it up, leading my file with the cautionary note that this behavior was exceptional in LA, and then went off to cover a space shot. A few days later, back from Jet Propulsion Labs, I got the tentative version of the full rooftop living story from New York. The paragraph with my quotes began, Typically cutting edge, La La Land burgeons with rooftop living. <laughs> In those days, burgeon was one of Newsweek's favorite words. La La Land was equally common and equally unforgivable usage. Anyway, I called up the fact checker, a young Vassar girl, to remind her of my cautionary note. LA, I said pointedly, was not filled with rooftop living. Got it, she said. Following Monday, the story appeared in the magazine, and La La Land still burgeoned. <laughs> I used to tell this anecdote just out of simple amusement at the way a story conceived in New York became a template, and we reporters on the ground were basically quote machines to fill in the blanks. Nowadays, it seems to me this behavior has, if anything, spread to far more serious parts of the news hole than the life and leisure section, and with apologies, it is burgeoning there. I should point out that though the press release for this talk said I'm accusing the media of myth-making today, I'm, I'm actually saying something a bit different. Myths, I think, are manufactured out of whole cloth. What I'm calling a template is based on facts, some facts, a partial collection, the first dusting. It then becomes adopted as the narrative, the mental doors locked shut, and no further facts are allowed in. Maybe you read Peter Moss's remarkable article in the New Yorker in January, reporting on the iconic story and image of the Iraq War, the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue. What caught my attention about this meticulous piece of journalism were the recollection, recollections of reporters and photographers in Baghdad who kept trying to sell New York editors and producers on the idea of turning around and looking away from the statue, seeing the crowd of perhaps 300 people in the square watching U.S. Marines doing most of the toppling. New York wanted none of it. The iconic image was the story, and any reporting and photography which undercut its salience was less than unwelcome. Here's Moss. Quote, a visual echo chamber developed. Rather than encouraging reporters to find the news, editors urged them to report what was on TV, unquote. He quotes NPR's reporter in Baghdad in an oral history that was published by the Columbia Journalism Review. Anne Garrels recalled telling her editors they were getting the story wrong. There were so few people trying to pull down the statue, they can't do it themselves. Many people were just sort of standing, hoping for the best, but they weren't joyous. Maas also quotes a, quotes a news photographer in Baghdad, Gary Knight, who talked with one of his editors on his satellite phone. The editor, watching the event on TV, asked why Knight wasn't taking pictures. Knight replied, Few Iraqis were involved, and the ones who were seemed to be doing so for the benefit of the photographers. It was a show. The editor told him, get off the phone, start taking pictures. The past few months, we've seen something similar with regard to the State Department cables leaked to WikiLeaks. A staple of most of the stories written about this matter is the plain assertion that WikiLeaks dumped a quarter of a million cables on the public record. It's become a meme, a trope, a cliche, a lampoon of a travesty of a farce. And as those who can count will attest, it's wildly counterfactual. Last time I looked, it was less than 5% of the cables provided to the website that had actually been published. Your figures may vary slightly, but that's at best a micro dump. Yet data dump has become the template, and whether you admire or despise Julian Assange, your story is probably going to include it. If not when you're finished with it, then when your editor or producer is. And then. There's a little matter of Katrina. As noted er earlier, I'm an adopted New Orleanian. 
when the big, scary spiral appeared on weather maps whirling across the Gulf of Mexico, I was in Los Angeles preparing to appear in a comedy film, for your consideration, on, DV na on DVD now. <laughs> Got to do it. But in every spare moment, and when you're acting in a film, most of your moments are spare, I was glued to television, the internet, my own sources, devouring the news from New Orleans, Google earthing my home, calling friends to make sure they were safe. The day after the movie wrapped, November 6th, I flew into a town where the only vehicles on the streets were Humvees. The sidewalks were lined with tens of thousands of thrown out refrigerators, and there was a two mile long, city block wide, three story tall mountain of flood debris on the median of the main boulevard in a once fashionable neighborhood. Hot water had just been restored to the French Quarter. Daily mail service was months away. In the weeks that followed, the local newspapers and TV news broadcasts and radio talk shows were understandably focused on every detail of the city's near destruction. And so they were filled with, among other things, constantly updated interim findings from two independent scientific investigations into the catastrophic flooding of New Orleans. Now, you probably remember the bold post-Katrina proclamations that CNN and NBC and God knows who else were establishing bureaus in New Orleans. And the people assigned to those bureaus were, I'm sure, good folks, people who may have seen unimaginable distress and suffering and horror in a modern, well, almost modern American city. Why then were those correspondents unwilling or unable to pass on what we were seeing in our local media confirmed beyond dispute when the two investigations released their final reports, both concluding that the flooding of New Orleans was not a natural disaster, but a massive man-made engineering failure, the greatest since Chernobyl. By the way, the Pulitzer people noticed the local daily won two prizes for its flood coverage, much of which focused on those findings. So, answering my own question. Editors and producers in New York saw that ominous spiral. They saw the hurricane slam into coastal Mississippi, where Katrina undeniably did major storm damage. They saw the windows of the Hyatt blown and the Superdome roof damage. And then they saw New Orleans flood. And they saw, as everybody except President Bush did, the video of the crowds at the Dome in the Convention Center. They put those first facts together, and a template was born. Big storm, city below sea level poor black victims. Now, almost nobody who covered Katrina was from or familiar with the peculiar geography of New Orleans. I realized that on day one when I saw a CNN reporter on Girard Street in the Central Business District begin his stand-up with the words, I'm here in the French Quarter, <laughs> which then as now was a quarter mile away. Logistics had its own allure. The Convention Center and Dome were a short drive from a major off-ramp of Interstate 10. The largely flooded Lakeview and Gentilly and Broadmoor neighborhoods, the one majority white, the others racially mixed, were farther away, spread out over a confusing grid where parallel streets intersect. Farther still, the eastern suburban county, St. Bernard Parish, had its entire housing stock, 100 percent, flooded out, its white working class residents on roofs for four days without food and water in the searing heat. But strangers didn't know where St. Bernard was or how to get there, if they even knew it existed. So the people on their roofs in St. Bernard never were on television. Sea level, Dr. Richard Campanell of Tulane University did an exhaustive study and released his findings two years after the disaster. Even now, half of populated New Orleans, that excludes the wildlife refuge that's within the city limits, is at or above sea level. Areas that flooded in 2005 were below, above, and at sea level. In short, sea level did not determine whether you still had a home or a pile of sodden debris, perhaps with a drowned parent in the attic. Your main guarantee of protection was maximum distance from the structures of the hurricane protection system. Okay, to the cause of the flooding. Those two investigations, headed by eminent scientists and engineers, reached striking, strikingly similar conclusions pervasive design and construction flaws over four and a half decades under administrations of both political parties in that so-called hurricane protection system mandated by Congress and assembled under the exclusive jurisdiction and control of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
Had the system been competently put together, one of the authors of the report from UC Berkeley said, the result of Katrina in New Orleans would have been quite different. Quote, wet ankles. But by the time all these facts were on the public record, the strangers had long since moved on. The correspondents in the New Orleans bureaus were busy covering stories in Houston and Birmingham and Miami, almost as if the New Orleans bureau was just the Atlanta bureau downsized and moved to a lower rent neighborhood. And the template had hardened into a granite-like lobe in editors' and producers' brains. There is one other facet in all this. In 2006, in June of that year, I asked Brian Williams why, despite his obvious concern for the city, his viewers still didn't know why New Orleans had flooded. He told me this, quote, we just think the emotional stories are more compelling for our audience, unquote. But a bias towards sob stories is as old as William Randolph Hearst's first hard-on for an actress. <laughs> the tendency of the template to rule over facts, even when those facts, as in the case of the statue toppling or the city flooding, come from your own correspondence or from eminent independent authorities, when the facts don't even require expensive investigations but merely paying attention to the public record, that tendency is only increasing in the face of dozens of daily deadlines and ever tighter budgets. You can't stay on a story for very long, and when you come back, as everybody did to New Orleans for the fifth anniversary last fall, there's now corporate institutional ego involved in defending the template against the assault of new information. After all, the networks, cable and broadcast, brag big time about the ballsiness of their Katrina coverage. Anderson Cooper actually wagged a finger in Senator Mary Landrieu's face. Exactly how do you go about retracting a boast? This would all be just interesting fodder perhaps for a CGR for, CJR form were these templates not so powerful in shaping public understanding of major events. The notion that thousands of Baghdadis were toppling the statue of the tyrant served as the metaphor for an administration's claim that the invaders would be greeted as liberators. By the time everyone realized the mistake, a little insurgency was going on. The template's version of the New Orleans story, a man-made disaster transformed and triply marginalized as a freak weather event happening down there in that wacky corrupt town and mainly victimizing poor black people meant a rapid withering of political will to tackle the real problem before the creator of the disaster, the unreconstructed Army Corps of Engineers, had been handed $14 billion to do a bigger version of a system with, we are learning, some of the same flaws. It's interesting to note in that context that no official or engineer within the Army Corps suffered any negative career consequences, not even so much as a month's docked pay, for causing this disaster, but that the heads of the two independent investigations and a whistleblower inside the Corps have had very unpleasant consequences for standing up and being lonely truth-tellers. As Republicans used to say during the Clinton drama, that's a good lesson for the children. And of course, the template forged in this country influences coverage and understanding around the world. No less than the BBC World Service introducing a feature on the reform of the New Orleans police earlier this year, led with a sentence that said, Hurricane Katrina tore through New Orleans. I sent an email advising them of the factual weakness of that language. Two weeks later, the same feature ran on the BBC's domestic radio network, Radio 4, and in that intro, Hurricane Katrina still tore through New Orleans. Must have been all the rooftop living. <laughs> the good news about what I'm saying is I think that the usual debate about mainstream news coverage can, as the practitioners assume, be dismissed as moot. There are political pressures on both sides. Most journalists are vaguely liberal. Most media owners are not so vaguely conservative. <laughs> the far more pervasive biases, I suggest, those of logistics, of parachuting in and asking cab drivers, what's the mood here? And of templates formed in faraway offices are subtler and far more intractable. PolitiFact, after all, isn't every fact, and it probably can't ever be. A brief digression. A few months ago, a State Department source talked to the Washington Post about the problem of coping with corruption in Afghanistan. He complained of an endemic attitude there, what he called a culture of impunity. 
When I made my documentary about the flooding of New Orleans, what I found was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which undergoes no meaningful congressional or outside oversight, so it tends to repeat its mistakes always at a higher price point. I came to conclude that the Corps operates in its own culture of impunity. Now back to our topic. Journalists don't always shrink from criticizing their colleagues for sins of commission. Two words, Judy Miller. <laughs> but the sins of omission of editors and producers filtering out facts that interfere with the narrative, the template that they've adopted, are rarely called out by colleagues. Peter Moss needed ProPublica to fund his reporting on the Saddam statue toppling. Aren't the editors and producers who insisted on the news-free repetition of the story they were seeing on TV as culpable for misleading the country about the war as Judy Miller? And I had to come over from the comedy world to tell the story of what really happened in New Orleans. Anderson Cooper still insists he's keeping him honest. So where's the accountability? If I understand the system correctly, readers and viewers are supposed to vote with their dollars and their remotes for the superior sources of information, market forces at work. So that means the very people whom the template robs of information are somehow supposed to know what they've been deprived of and to enforce market discipline against the editors and producers responsible. You know what that sounds like to me? Like a culture of impunity. And now I take off my scrubs and my reflector. I'm no doctor and I don't even play one on TV. I do play an insanely greedy industrialist and political manipulator with major media interests, but that doesn't seem relevant. <laughs> Returning to the medical metaphor, maybe I can diagnose correctly I sure can't prescribe. If you ask me what I would suggest to solve the situation I've outlined, let me point out that, except for certain lapses into magazine writing and documentary filmmaking, I chose to leave journalism several years ago. That was my solution to the problem. Something tells me it probably won't work system-wide. As to that larger situation, I do want to conclude these remarks with a cogent three-word suggestion. Release the hounds. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for that. A uh, few questions uh, from our audience, as well as maybe a few that I have devised on my own, and we hope to have a pleasant mix of those two. Uh, sort of transparency offered for you there. Um, <laughs> Early this morning, I was sent an email that alerted me about the Washington Post story, which sort of uh, wasn't necessarily a setup for today's uh, speech, but it did maybe put some things in context, particularly at, with respect to a timeline. Um, and it talks about you going to Capitol Hill to sort of do the legislative piece, I guess, to this. Could you talk about what that involves and, and what your hopes are there and what kind of reception either you've had in the past and talking about as it described, I think, decommissioning the Army Corps of Engineers? Oh, uh, de decommissioning is what you do with nuclear plants, not with a federal agency. Um, and you need guys with masks to go on and decommission, which... Um, this is a first, you know. I I'm, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm not a, a, an activist. I'm a pacifist. <laughs> not pacifist, passivist. Um, <laughs> I like to sit at home and watch TV. Um, I have some people who are going to who are arranging some meetings with me on the Hill. Um, we explain in the movie, thanks to those who have studied the Corps far more than I have, including a, a wonderful journalist who used to work in this town, is now in Miami, Michael Grunwald, who did a, a fabulous five-part series in the Post in 2000 on the, the Corps. The Corps is the creature of Congress. The Corps is the way it is because Congress likes it that way. Uh, the Corps, in its civil works projects here in, the, in this country, not its military projects abroad, is basically a, a, an earmark-driven institution. So congressmen appropriate for a specific project, coincidentally in their district. And um, the core builds them. Uh, the core has now uh, been hollowed out to the extent that they don't do mo most of their own work. Uh, so private contractors are engaged. So you have this sort of iron triangle of contractors who uh, give money to elect congressmen, uh, core, they get core contracts. Everybody's happy except the recipients of the projects. Um, me personally, I'm delighted to go to the Hill and talk to, to members, uh, but uh, personal opinion of a guy from the comedy world, 
Uh, I don't think anything's really going to change until uh, serious effort is uh, expended by the executive branch. So your documentary has been out, I don't know, what, about five months, something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was just shown for one night. Yeah. Now it's really out. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, the substance of that material has been released to the public, and now I guess you're going to engage in a series of screenings around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of traction do you feel that uh, essentially this thesis has been gaining? Uh, close to the vanishing point so far because of the, what I was talking about in, the, in my remarks, the, the desire of, you know, the major media came to New Orleans. We were there. Hey, come talk to us. We got an interesting story for you, the other side of, of what you've been reporting for the last five years. Uh, very few of them took the bait. Brian uh, very kindly made a remark in passing uh, on the panel at Meet the Press about the film, but didn't say much about what it contained. Uh, Katie did nothing. Diane did nothing. NPR did nothing. Bye-bye, Vivian. Um, um, PBS did a nice piece on uh, uh, Need to Know. Um, that's about it. So we're still trying to get attention. Not, this is not a career move on my part. You know, uh, This is about changing the country's awareness of what happened uh, to a major American city. And also, because this is not just a New Orleans story, as we point out in the film. The Corps doesn't single out New Orleans for special treatment. They, they do a little bit. The, the New Orleans core district is, is worse than most. But there are more than 100 cities in this country where the core has levy systems that are protecting them. Uh, several of them know they're in trouble. Dallas, uh, they've been told that their levees are built on sand. Uh, Sacramento, California, it's well known inside the core, if not in the area, that that levy system is um, not in the greatest of shape, and of course Sacramento sits atop the entire California water system. So it's a it's going to be a big story when that happens. I'd make your plane reservations now. So uh, someone here is asking, uh, who are the reporters that you admire and respect who have covered New Orleans, if, the, if there is one, they're putting it in plural, mm -hmm. and who and what news organizations are getting it right, poses the questioner. I think John Schwartz of the Times has done some really good work in New Orleans. Um, uh, Kane Bordeaux at the AP um, from time to time has done good stuff. Mark Schlefstein and, uh, and John McQuaid of the Times-Picayune. Uh, those are the guys that won the Pulitzers. That's the gold standard for me. Uh, there's also a, a local newspaper weekly in, in New Orleans, the Gambit Weekly, that does good work. Um, those, those are mine. So you've talked a little bit about, uh, and the movie I think depicts this, uh, about how Congress isn't, in you know, the way you um, view it, set up to sort of act as the appropriate uh, intermediary for the American people mm -hmm. in, in policing this problem. What about uh, local and state officials in New Orleans and Louisiana? We hosted Governor Jindal here a couple of years ago, and he was certainly very vocal, I recall, after the BP oil spill about some steps that he thought should be done. What, what, what's your view of how the locals view the problem and what should be done? He got some good TV time during BP, didn't he? Um, the problem is locals can scream and shout, but the core is the uh, has exclusive jurisdiction over this. Was given it by the Congress when Congress mandated the um, building of this system after Hurricane Betsy. The core has something else going for it. In 1927, Congress passed the Flood Control Act, which gives the core blanket immunity from any legal consequences of flood control projects that it builds. That's why there has not been a race to the courtroom following the flooding of New Orleans, because in most cases, lawsuits have been thrown out because the Corps has blanket immunity. Uh, there is only one case that has proceeded. Interestingly, uh, there's been a little bit about it in the, in the national press. I think that both the Times and the Post wrote about the verdict when it came down. A federal judge ruled in a 150-page opinion that the Corps was criminally negligent by uh, failing to maintain a navigation canal that it built, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, which was responsible for the majority of the flooding of St. Bernard Parish and the Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, that came to trial only because uh, that was a navigation project and it was not covered by the Flood Control Act. But I've wandered away from your question. That's quite all right. I'm sorry. We have time. Okay. 
I forget what the question was. Well, I wandered away. It was the responsiveness of local. Oh, state. right, yeah, yeah. So they scream and shout. Um, there's been, I should say, uh, given the amount of uh, obloquy, thank you very much, that has come New Orleans' way in the wake of the disaster, a remarkable amount of civic action in the post-flood period in New Orleans. People in New Orleans reformed the, the uh, levy districts. They reformed the tax assessor's offices. They reformed the district attorney office. Uh, they did a lot of the heavy lifting to reform their city government. That's what they could do. They could not make the core, uh, just to take one example, impose a factor of safety, that's engineering speak for a cushion, on the urban levy system that was as high as the factor of safety the core uses for rural dams. That's one of our little problems is the core has a much lower factor of safety for a levy system that's supposed to protect a major metropolitan area than for a dam in the middle of nowhere. Nothing we can do about that from the local level. Here's a specific question about the core, uh, and this uh, questioner obviously knows more about this particular subject than I'm able to interpret. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what do you think of the core's work in channeling the Mississippi River? You know, it's a, it, the, the channeling of the Mississippi River is a almost classic core success story because in terms of the tasks they set for themselves, they accomplished it really well. The Mississippi River level, uh, levees have never failed, at least in New Orleans. They may have failed upriver. I'm not aware of that, but they've been great in New Orleans. Um, it's done what, it, what they set out to do. It is a classic core success story in that there have been untold, unintended negative consequences that the core has been either oblivious to or late to arrive at. So, for example, when you levy the Mississippi River, you prevent it from flooding. Well, that's a good thing. But the flooding of the Mississippi River distributed every spring flood water and sediment over the delta, building the coastal wetlands of Louisiana, the most verdant and fertile home for seafood and other creatures of, of that environment in the entire North American continent. When you levy the river, you begin starving the wetlands and they begin shrinking. And you have the first ingredient in the long-term slow motion disaster that is enveloping southern Louisiana, the erosion of the coastal wetlands. Why is that important, aside from if you like shrimp? Every mile of, of wetlands between the Gulf of Mexico and the city of New Orleans bats down hurricane ferocity by a known quantity. The wind coming over water pick up energy as the winds go over land, they lose energy. We lose the wetlands, we lose one of our major protections. Questioner asks, how has the local New Orleans community responded to the documentary? It wasn't made for New Orleans. I assume the people in New Orleans knew this stuff. Uh, so I was startled. Uh, the picture was supposed to play there for one night and it played for weeks in uh, uh, the major local radio talk show host, I saw him walking, watching the movie the first night and I, he couldn't sit down, steam was coming out of his ears. And he said, you're gonna be on tomorrow for the whole three hours. He, he says, everybody in the city has to see this movie. People have been startled, I think. They did not know the story of the whistleblower. New Orleans media did not cover her, but they knew the rest of the story, but it was in day-to-day -day drips and drabs. And nobody had ever before come and put it together into a 90-minute package. Uh, and in a way, I felt badly, because last year was, was the first year of what everybody around the town thought of as the end, the post-post-Katrina period. We had gotten over the post-Katrina period. We were now in the new era. We had a new mayor. City, the Saints had won the Super Bowl. The city was almost levitating until the BP oil spill. And now I come along and say, and by the way, we're not as safe as we think we are. Okay, so this person says, and this is, uh, writing in the uh, first person, <laughs> I truly appreciate your informed opinions and stance on New Orleans and media, but do you feel that more or, well, let's say more or fewer celebrities should be voicing their opinions on issues of the day? And I guess that gets to the question of 
If you look at the news media in general, you could ask a broader question of do you think it's fixated on entertainment too much as well? Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Thank you. Charlie Sheen, Charlie Sheen, Charlie. Um, we could go on that way for the rest of the hour. Um, look, I, I'm very careful. I was really scared when I made this documentary because a guy from The Simpsons and Spinal Tap talking to me about engineering? Really? I need to pay to see that? So what I say is not my opinion. I have no opinion. I, I, I have no basis for forming an opinion. I, I go to the people in the movie and in my life who know what they're talking about, the leaders of these two investigations, this whistleblower, uh, John Barry, the author of Rising Tide, the, the seminal book on the 1927 flood. I, I pay attention to what they say. I, I try to distill it so I can understand it, and then when somebody asks me a question, that's basically what you get. Um, I, I have no, you know, the, the building I walked fastest past when I was going to college was the engineering building, for God's sake, lest something rub off. Um, but the good news is that these people uh, that I mentioned who are in the film and in my life to some extent uh, are really good communicators and teachers, and uh, they've made it clear to me made it comprehensible to me so that I could turn around and, you know, I'm, I'm not an opinionator, I'm a, I'm, I'm a passer through. Uh, as to other celebrities, you know, I think other celebrities are like anybody else. If, you, if it seems like they know what they're talking about, then they should be in the public sphere and, 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 and maybe have a moment of attention. If they seem like they're crazy and out of control and don't know what they're talking about, they should get hours and hours of primetime coverage. <laughs> I did catch your radio bit, though, where I think last week you said something like it's more interesting to hear crazy people than sane people, yes. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I mean, we didn't invent this. The English did. They charged money to see the crazy people at Bedlam. So we're the same folks. So the next question, as a follow-up to the last one, uh, asks, are you concerned about any potential repercussions about taking a political stance, I suppose, on the receptivity of the audience toward your entertainment work? Um, well, The Simpsons kind of is on its own there, you know. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I, I'm hurting it uh, by, by doing this. Uh, I hope not. Um, I, I try to make what I'm doing in this context um, non-political in the sense, non-partisan, because I think both parties bear responsibility for what happened in New Orleans. Both parties are now, the presidents of both parties have now clearly sent a signal that they're not going to lift a finger to uh, prevent what happened from happening again. Um, so it's easy for me to say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, don't, don't one side get mad at me because I'm, I'm not picking on you. Um, I think one reason, and I'm speculating here, so this is, you know, you can ignore this as comedian opinion. I think one reason that the story about New Orleans, aside from the, the, the habit of mind that I pointed out in my talk, um, hasn't gotten the traction it might have, is, that, is the very fact that both parties have their oar in this water. Uh, neither side gets any political juice out of saying it's their fault. And that's what makes our system go, both uh, politically and uh, journalistically. Uh, you can't get... Uh, a Democrat and Republican to argue on, on a cable news that it's your fault and no, it's your fault because it's both their fault. And uh, they'd rather just talk about something else. And so you're doing this uh, t essentially a tour with the movie now. Uh, tell us where that will be and uh, how long until it is released on DVD. We're going around the country. It opened in Dallas on Friday night. I got to sit in uh, the seat that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald sat in when he was arrested, so my butt is part of history. Um, <laughs> And it's at the Texas Theater all week in Dallas, and then we're opening up around the country uh, through throughout the spring and, and early summer. Uh, the big big uneasy the big website front page has a list of all the places where the film is showing and when uh, in theaters around the country. And then uh, we will make a, a DVD and VOD and DVD 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 deals, uh, all those initials, and uh, it'll be out on. Uh, online and, and uh, maybe even on cable if they've got room for it, although HBO said, we've done New Orleans.
Okay, so uh, obviously people want to talk about your creative work a little bit, uh, have you talk about that a little bit. Uh, one person says, you have said that you think The Simpsons has declined in quality. Uh, could you just address that? Is that true? Uh, some, obviously some episodes are better than others. Where mm -hmm. does it stand now? That was a uh, private communication <laughs> that was leaked to the New York Post, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who also owns The Simpsons. Uh, in advance of a uh, salary renegotiation. <laughs> it's a wonderful show. I love being a part of it. How, how does Fox TV react to being mocked on The Simpsons? You know, they love it. Uh, Rupert loves it. Um, powerful people uh, seem to love uh, the humanizing effect of uh, persuading the public that they have a sense of humor. Um, I'm reminded of George W. Bush joking about the search for WMDs at the radio TV correspondence dinner. Um, I personally, when I see powerful people uh, showing off their sense of humor, I hide under the bed. But that's just me. Um, no, Fox is perfectly fine with it. Rupert's perfectly fine with it. Uh, I think they think it's great for business. <laughs> At the 1992 Republican National Convention, President then H.W. Bush said, we're going to keep trying to strengthen the American family to make them more like the Waltons and less <laughs> like, like the, the Simpsons. Simpsons. So 19 years later, the Simpsons has spawned numerous books and even college classes, and I guess it's in its 22nd season now. How do you think the Simpsons reflects the American family, or does it? You know, I'll, I'll take that question and, and move it a little bit to one, one side because of, of an observation that I feel better making an observation than some, you know, conclusion based on my, my limited knowledge of American families. When The Simpsons started, we were uh, roundly criticized by Christian groups uh, in particular. Uh, Bart is a bad role, role model, they said, uh, as if the lead comic character in any show is, is a good role model, you know. Um, Fifteen years later, I play both uh, Ken, uh, uh, both uh, Ned Flanders and uh, Reverend Lovejoy, the two avowedly Christian characters on the show, and, total coincidence, and uh, I found myself being interviewed for cover stories in Christian magazines, <laughs> discovering after 15 years that this was the only show on American primetime television where family regularly went to church and where there were avowed Christians as members of the, of the cast. What that told me was that it took an awful long time for uh, certain people to discover the actual shape of the elephant. The questioner says, my son, the questioner's son embraced the philosophy of Bart Simpson when he was uh, in the sixth grade and he still embraces at age 28. We don't know if he's still at home or not. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like it. Is. Yeah, to what do you attribute that uh, remarkable longevity? Well, I think you fed him well. Oh, you mean the show? Um, well, first of all, in all honesty, the fabulous, fabulous, fabulous acting. No, uh, seriously. Um, I think it's, uh, I will mention two factors that I think don't get recognized often enough. Number one, um, I would invite you to uh, look for half a second if you can, at um, any of the major or minor animated shows on television in the last 20 years. Um, and I think maybe two of them visually tell you in a half second what show they are. I, I would think of Ren and Stimpy uh, and The Simpsons. I think it, it was Matt Groening's genius that he couldn't draw very well. He says that himself. And uh, he adopted this very iconic style. He, he chose the color yellow, which was the closest he could come to flesh. And he, he just chose a, 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 a drawing style, a visual style for the show that is immediately recognizable, that in the modern parlance brands it on, on first and every site. And secondly, and more significantly I think, again not very well known, when uh, Fox first put The Simpsons on, Fox was a fledgling network to say the least, 
you may recall it was on mainly UHF channels. You needed to attach a wire coat hanger to, you know, improve reception. And so uh, it was important for them to have the legitimacy of having well-known Hollywood talent aboard. And Jim Brooks had a wonderful movie career. Um, and so he had the leverage to be able to say, we'll do the show, no network interference. No creative interference by the network. And so for 22, now 23 years, we're just starting our 23rd season, there has never been a time, as far as I know, I'm not in on the meetings, but as far as I know, where the network has told, you know, sh couldn't Mr. Burns be just a little bit less evil, you know, up his Q rating a little bit? That doesn't happen with us. Now, you think in a culture that supposedly loves and emulates success, other television networks would try this little technique. But I remember about four or five years ago, ABC was having a down period, and, and the then programming chief of ABC was speaking to the advertisers at the upfront luncheon. And she said, talking about the new fall schedule, we got a great slate of shows, and we have a whole new layer of network supervision to ensure that they, and I'm going, great, that'll do well. So, so much for emulating success. As a writer yourself, are you ever tempted to work on the scripts, or have you? No and no. Um, well, I've been tempted, I, uh, but the television writing process is not uh, conducive to me, to, to the way I like to write. I like to write with maybe one or two chosen, uh, mutually selected uh, collaborators. The television uh, pr uh, production process dictates that you will be collaborating with 16 people that you may never have met before in a room with a lot of cold pizza. Um, and that something that has your name on it will probably two-thirds of it have been written by somebody else. So uh, it works great for the show, but it's just not what I choose to do. Question about Kent Brockman on The Simpsons. Yes, sir. <laughs> Kent Brockman in the house. There you go. Who did you, if anyone, base him on? Someone says he reminds the writer of this question a bit of Howard Beale, the uh, anchorman uh, in the network. network, yes. And uh, what goes through your head when you act as him? Well, what goes through your head is supposed to be what goes through the character's head. So in the case of Kent Brockman, it's nothing. <laughs> uh, too cheap, too easy. Um, I kind of based him. We were talking before uh, we started here about Mark's last name and the fact that uh, in years past there were a number of people with similar names anchoring local news around the country, the Hambrick brothers. And I guess a little bit of uh, one, of the, one or another of the Hambricks uh, rubbed off on uh, old Kent. I don't know. Seems to me there's a little bit of Hambrick in all of us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs> With all the projects you've worked on in your career, which have you found to be the most rewarding? Sure, you, you don't speak financially. Um, this is Spinal Tap. Um, <laughs> it was four guys sitting around thinking up an idea, uh, banging on doors all over Hollywood, getting uh, a succession of, of rejections. Um, finding one fluke that allowed the film to get made in a company that didn't want to release it. Uh, we just kept hearing guillotine slam right behind us as we escaped the platform. Uh, getting it out there, having it become adopted and beloved by generations of audiences, having the same people who told us, no, we don't want to make your movie, the same individuals, come running up after us eight years later and say, and offering us money to make a sequel and getting to say no to them. I think everybody loves the movie. Uh, and did you not say on Letterman that, uh, or is it not true, that that is what people ask you to do most is a line from that movie as opposed to something else? No, it's, it's sort of different. I mean, I can never tell what people are going to, uh, people ask about the, the, the Spinal Tap, about The Simpsons, about my radio show. Uh, I think the good thing about having a varied career is that it keeps you on your toes with the audience because as people come up to talk to you, you can't play in your head what they're going to say. You can't anticipate. It's not going to be the same thing over and over again. Uh, I, I should say the other reward of Spinal Tap is that we actually got, have been able to uh, play nationwide and worldwide and uh, 
don't let anybody ever tell you it's not fun to play dumb music loud. <laughs> Someone asked, did you write any of the songs on either Mighty Wind or Spinal Tap? Yeah, Michael and McKean and I wrote a lot of the songs in Mighty Wind. Um, and uh, we all wrote the songs in Spinal Tap. Chris Guest, my, uh, Rob Reiner, Michael, and I, myself uh, were all together writing the songs for that movie. Um, that was part of the fun. I mean, the fun was, that was a movie that we got to make start to finish, a totally handmade project. We're all involved in every facet of it, uh, beginning to end. And, uh, you know, as opposed to being part of an industrial process, which some big budget movies are, being part of a handmade process is, is what I love best. So. so I had to ask, because I set it up a little bit in the introduction, did Mel Blanc really play a formative role in your ability to come up with characters? Probably by osmosis. Um, I worked on the Jack Benny program for eight years, and Mel, Mel Blanc was a member of the cast, and uh, he had a son the same age as me, and uh, so took a, a fatherly interest. I should point out, in modern America, uh, not a fatherly interest as in the Catholic Church fatherly interest, <laughs> just a benignly paternal interest. Um, but he, you know, it was never a matter where he said, here's how I do bugs and here's how I do Porky. Uh, it, it never got to that level. So. Uh, it was just being around a, a, a genius like that, I guess. Something rubbed off, maybe. Very good. Okay, well, stay, stay here. Uh, we're almost out of time, but before asking the last question, a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, for our audience and you, I'd like to remind about our upcoming luncheon speakers. The next one will go from uh, humorous today to dead serious April 6th. That'll be the commissioner of the IRS. Gah! <laughs> we'll make sure you're out of the building. Yeah, by please. Then. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't here, I wasn't here. <laughs> but uh, April 19th, Ted Turner and T. Boone Pickens. Uh, Turner will discuss renewable and alternative energy, solar projects uh, across the nation, climate change. Mr. Pickens will address his crusade to reduce the nation's dependence on OPEC, which he regards as a threat to the U.S. economy and national security. Now. Ask them both for money. Absolutely. <laughs> we could use it. We could use it. Uh, well, and our uh, tradition here for every guest speaker, it's our truly token way of saying thank you, <laughs> uh, to present you with the traditional NPC coffee mug. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and our final question of the day, and that is, we, we talked about him earlier, if Kent Brockman were with <laughs> us here today, how would he have reported on your speech? Simpson's star ignores what most people want to hear about. Details at 11. <laughs> Thank you. thank you, Harry. That was great. Thank you all for coming today. I'd like to thank National Press Club staff, including the library and, broad and our broadcast center, for helping to organize today's event. And finally, here's a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. If you'd like to get a copy of today's program, check it out at www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. CBN News. And I'm told the second baseman on the NPC softball team. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's only the softball team in attendance today because Mike Deagle is public affairs communications consultant and first baseman. So you have the, the double play combination in place there. We have Matt Friedman. He's one of my colleagues at Associated Press as an online video producer, and he's also a new member. So welcome, Matt. Mark Cannon is managing editor for public safety communications. Spencer Joint, who's Harry's godson, freshman at Georgetown University, and a guest of the speaker. John Doman is an anchor reporter for Westwood One Metro Networks. David Korn, Washington Bureau Chief of Mother Jones and an analyst for MSNBC and also a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the podium for just a moment, Melissa Charbonneau, Newshook Media, chair of the speaker's committee. We'll skip over the speaker for a moment. Patty Gillio is a communications consultant and speakers committee member who organized today's event. Bill Schneider is former CNN political analyst, now teaching public policy at George Mason University, guest of the speaker, and also with Third Way, which is a Washington think tank. Tim Young is a freelance journalist and himself actually a working comedian. He's chair of the National Press Club's Young Members Committee, which he's leading very well. 
Rachel Ray is U.S. television reviewer for the Daily Telegraph of London. And Charlie Clark, another new member here at the Press Club, he's senior correspondent with Government Executive Magazine. And now, how about a round of applause? Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick. I'm a broadcast journalist for the Associated Press and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, we'd invite you to please visit our website at www.press.org and to donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library. You can find that information on our website as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table guests include guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club available through iTunes. And you can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag pound NPC lunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A, and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests, and I'd ask each of you here on the table to stand up briefly as your name is announced, and we begin from your right. Dana Ritter, White House producer for C- and that's when we discussed having him here today. Before that, some of the stories titled Crescent City Stories told about the hurricane's aftermath via online video were very compelling. They're still there. You can see those on the website, My Damn Channel. Harry's focused a fair amount of attention on the news media's handling of the Katrina story. And as some of you may know, one of my priorities this year is to use our luncheon series to focus more on journalism. That's something we did just a week ago with Vivian Schiller, who at the time was head of National Public Radio. <laughs> as we know now, she's since resigned. While some of the subjects we're going to discuss today have serious themes, I know we're all looking forward to enjoying the unique sense of multifaceted sense of humor that's just one of the many gifts that our guest speaker has been blessed with. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to Harry Shearer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, Central Time. Um, I'm honored and delighted to have been invited to uh, appear here at the National Press Club today. In fact, just to get this out of the way right at the top, I'd venture to say that this whole occasion is excellent. <laughs> and I do want to pledge to you that, uh, unlike another recent guest at this podium, nothing I say today here will be contradicted by one of my executives in two days in a video sting. <laughs> Mainly because I have no executives. All right, so I've ripped off Rupert Murdoch and tossed a brush back pitch at Vivian Schiller. We can now get down to the business at hand. Uh, first, I want to say, as a New Orleanian, uh, my heart goes out to the people of Japan. People of New Orleans know a little bit about what you're going through right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as much as I was bewitched and besotted by comedy at an early age, I was also fascinated and seduced by journalism. I can remember at age five or whenever it was my parents first trusted me with blunt little scissors, cutting out and collecting the mastheads for all the different sections of the two daily papers we subscribed to, the main criterion for which was whichever papers in L.A. were still publishing and weren't the Times. When my moment came to be interviewed on TV by Art Linkletter, I confessed to my habit of making my parents take me to the out-of-town newsstand in Hollywood whenever possible, and for years our mailbox was filled with dailies from Fergus Falls, Minnesota, and other far-flung locales. A couple days late, but it didn't seem to matter. When I entered college at the tender age of 15, my first stop was at the office of the student newspaper, where I ended up as a senior editor. Thank you. <laughs> Our only source of income at the publication was if we had the, go the job of putting the paper to bed at night, which involved working in a noisy old letterpress print shop, 
where the entire staff except for the foreman was comprised of what we used to call deaf mutes. My chance at the editor-in-chief role was ruined by my refusal to disclose to the student council So those of you who are familiar with our lunch and speaker series here at the National Press Club probably know that the format calls for this to run about an hour in length. Well, this is particularly difficult and challenging today for the simple reason that getting through a proper introduction of our speaker, reviewing all of his accomplishments, accolades, and activities could probably take up the entire hour. But that would be not what you're here for. Our guest is an actor known for, among other things, the many character voices for The Simpsons, including Mr. Burns, Smithers, and Principal Skinner. He's been a regular cast member on Saturday Night Live, and his many movie credits include The Right Stuff, The Fisher King, The Truman Show, This is Spinal Tap, and The Mighty Wind, among others. He's an author, director, and satirist, a musician, a radio host, a playwright, and a record label owner. He's a Los Angeles native. He began his acting career during his childhood, making appearances on the Jack Benny program. It was then that he got to know the great Mel Blanc, who did a few voices in his day as well. He appeared in the pilot of Leave it to Beaver in the role that would eventually morph into that of Eddie Haskell. <laughs> True story. Got a lot of applause on that. Yeah. Very well remembered. For the past few years, though, he's been writing about the causes and aftermath of the 2005 New Orleans flood. On this subject and others, he's a regular contributor to Huffington Post, he also made a feature-length documentary titled The Big Uneasy. I was fortunate enough to meet him last fall during a screening of that movie here in town.